Okay. Welcome to Facsimile. I'm Ryan Brown, author of Dear Coffee Buyer and your host. I'm joined by Aida Batley. Hello, Aida. Hello. We're excited to cup some coffee with you. We've ground each of the four samples in bowls here in front of us, and we're both heating water right now. Mm -hmm. Subscribers, I hope your samples are ready. You'll want to use a ratio of one gram of coffee to 17 grams of water. My cups have 11 grams of ground coffee and I'll pour 187 grams of water into each. Please feel free to pause and catch up. If you're not a subscriber, Facsimile helps you become a better coffee taster. Each month, we send you four carefully selected, skillfully roasted samples to cup along with experts. You can subscribe in the link below. Speaking of experts, our guest cupper today is the one and only Aida Batley. Simply put, Aida is the reason that coffee producers experiment with coffee selection, fermentation, and processing. She is a fifth generation coffee farmer meaning that her great-great-grandfather had a coffee farm in El Salvador in the late 19th century. She oversees her three family farms, Kilimanjaro, Mauritania, and Los Alpes, all named by her mountain-loving father, as well as her own personal farm, Tanzania. She was the first woman to ever win the Cup of Excellence, the first person to ever win the El Salvador Cup of Excellence, and her coffee has been used by national barista champions across the world. Aida was also the first coffee farmer to earn a Barista Guild of America certification. Remarkably, hold on, this exhaustive list of accomplishments understates what is truly special about Aida. It's her insatiable curiosity and desire to see how far she can bend coffee to her will that has encouraged a generation of farmers to explore what their own coffee is capable of and serves as a positive inspiration for the entire industry. Finally, hold on, we're not done. The table in front of us features four samples produced by Aida. I'm sure you already know this. Uh, Aida has prepared each of these, the same, the same farm, elevation, cultivars, soil inputs and harvest practices. <clears throat> Everything is the same except how they're processed. This will be certainly an enlightening and I think really fun table. Aida, it is such a pleasure to have you here with us today. I can't wait to cut these with you. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, everyone. Uh, I also, Scott, as you can see, is in the YouTube chat. Uh, I also have it live, so I can see some questions and comments. Uh, I will be quite engaged with Aida during this cupping as we describe what we're tasting. Um, but otherwise, I, I think that that's, uh, you know, please send questions. We have a few already. We would love to see more. Another thing, uh, in the calendar invite. There is a link to a cupping results survey. Please, if you've already cupped the, the coffees, shame on you. And also congratulations for being complete with the cupping. Uh, please go tell us what you thought of them. If you haven't, while you're cupping, please go share your results. We'll kind of talk about those towards the, uh, as after we cup them ourselves. Okay. Um, Aida, I, I always inventory my equipment because otherwise I will forget something. I will have forgotten something at the, at the absolute worst moment. I've got water going, 11 grams of coffee in each of these. Um, I've ordered my coffees blue, green, yellow, orange, red, orange. Okay. Are you this, are, you, are yours ordered the same way? No, mine's blue, green, orange, yellow. Can you switch? yellow and orange only. I'm only asking you to do this because I told everyone else to put them in that order. Oh, okay, hold on. And so it's either you change them or, or we all change them. You de I mean, you deserve that, but I but if you would be willing. <laughs> there, all set. Okay, and I, I know why you put the yellow last. Um, <laughs> perfect. Uh, I also have, I have my cupping spoons. I have a scale because I'm gonna weigh 187 grams. I have a <clears throat> cupping form here to take some notes as we're cupping and also some scores that I'll post later today. Uh, do you have all that stuff too? I forgot my cupping form. Oh, okay. <laughs> do you, do you want to get one or are you fine with that one? No, I don't have one here. I'm going to remember okay. remote space. Okay. So I want to leave. 
let's go ahead and jump in and start uh, smelling these and, and talk a lot about what we're smelling. So starting with blue. Mm, I'm getting some caramel, something floral, like maybe even a lavender. Definitely browned sugar. How about you? Definitely floral. Yeah, yeah. And green. What is that? More kind of a sweet nut praline toffee kind of aroma for me, fragrance for me. Yeah. Yellow. How about you on green? Wait, wait, which one are we at? Did we skip? Uh, sorry, green. Oh, green. Yeah. I'm definitely getting some stone fruit in there. Okay. Like some dried stone fruit. Yeah, okay, okay. Mm. Yellow has a um like a dulce de leche, like a like a like a really kind of um one of those rich creams, al almost like a gamey cream sweetness to it. Mm -hmm. What do you smell in yellow? It's that caramelly sweet. Yeah. Um, and also the, um, the, the top of the creme brulee. Yes. Yep. Totally. The only part of the creme brulee. <laughs> what about, what about orange? Getting like a tamarind. Okay. Yeah, there. Yeah, there's something that reminds me of an iced tea about that one, um, for sure. Um, I think tamarind is an, certainly a flavor that I might be associating with that. Hibiscus. Should we pour some water on these? Let's do it. Yeah. Okay, so again, I'm going to pour 187 grams. I'm gonna start this and it's gonna work perfectly. I'm pouring right now, Aida. Perfect. Another great thing about these cupping bowls is that they are so similar in weight that uh, if you do weigh your water, you really don't need to tear in between uh, to, pour, you know, to pour a very precisely similar amount. Precisely similar, that's, a, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> Uh, and I, I would say that in my, in my past, when I would use ceramic bowls, I probably broke <laughs> one a day, it felt like. <laughs> nope. I am loving these, the ones you sent. They're very, very cool. Okay, done with this guy. So Aida, you are cupping with us from Miami. Yes. Is that somewhere that you spend a lot of time? 
Um, I do, you know, as you know, I grew up in Miami um, and I'm here, you know, I'm grounded because of COVID, but I do fly back and forth to El Salvador, but I just haven't done any travel for business. And so I'm starting to work on a couple of new projects. What do those look like? Well, I can only show you, but I can't tell you what it is yet. So I'm working with... Um, it's just that bottle? You're just working on one bottle? No, I've got plenty. But I'm working okay, on okay. a very great beverage. And it's pretty cool because I am um, working with the University, of, uh, the University of Florida Food and Science Department. So I've got somebody that's helping me with this project. Then I've got another professor that the area of expertise is in fermentation. So um, we're gonna dive in this coming harvest with him and some of his students on working on processing and understanding, you know, really um, what's going on as opposed to me just being like, hey, it worked, yay. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm actually working on with another professor on sensory. So I'm really, really excited about this. Cause as you know, the UF is the one that developed Gatorade. So they're, you know, their food and science department is one of the best in the country. I see. Okay. I, I, I think as long as I've known you, you are always working on at least one secretive project. Like one kind of like, I, I wish I could tell you, I can let you look at it, but I can't tell you what's going on. It's a secret. You'll, you'll eventually know about it. Everyone will. <laughs> you'll know soon. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's, let's uh, go ahead and get ready to break these in a little bit. I started that a little bit before I poured. Uh, and I'm just gonna speak out loud with what I'm smelling as I do. Yeah, that, uh, that floral aspect of blue has continued Ooh. into kind of a potpourri for me. that caramelly on the green. Yeah, I certainly agree. There's kind of a, like a, like a burnt sugar. On yellow, that's yellow certainly coming alive with some fruit. Strawberries and cream. Yeah, very for sure. Is this the one that you said dried? stone fruit earlier i think so I yeah <laughs> prune or something and orange continues to remind me of an an iced tea, kind of um, some black tea notes, that tamarind or even lemon. Mm -hmm. Great. So we're going to skim these, and we'll we'll return to cup them before that before that clock behind me turns to twenty. Aida, I, you know, it, in my time in coffee, I would say that you are easily the most well-known coffee producer. That you're, the, you're the only one that I know that I could be in another continent away from North or Central America, and you are a first name basis. What do you think made that happen? Um, you know, for me, when I won COE, remember that, I would just moved to my to El Salvador. I was had been there. I moved in November. Heard about it in December. Entered two of the three farms we had at the time, and you know came in first and sixteenth. And for me, I knew I love COE. I think it is an incredible tool for producers. But you have to realize you only have months, not even a year, before the next one's going to come. So you have to make a, a name for yourself. You have to hustle. You have to do everything. Um, to try and get out there because 
you know, the next year will come and then there'll be another winner. We never participated again. I mean, to me, the COE was uh, something that introduced me into the market, you know, helped me meet buyers. And it's not to, that I know everybody, um, but, you know, I try to, again, just hustle and, and try to work and start focusing on the other things. But I mean, so many, so many, I, I, you know, I think there are so many other people who have won more, more recently or, or maybe even more frequently who don't have, don't have your same notoriety. And I don't know that there's a graceful way to, for you to answer this question. And so maybe I should abandon it, but there, there's something, there's like something more to it. Right. And you and I mean, you know, your the coffee from your farms is, is of exceptional quality year in and year out. Uh, that, but I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to pay, pay you compliments. I'm just saying you have great coffee, but like, I've also had, I've had better coffee from people and I don't know what their name, like, I still don't know what their names are. So mm -hmm. I'm just like, there's, there's what, is there some, like, can anyone tell me what, what you're, you are a rock star farmer. How, how did it happen? Superpower. <laughs> okay, okay. No, I mean, I, you know, to me, it's just, I know what you're saying, but it's getting out there. I mean, one of the uh, benefits I had was growing up in the U.S. and not in El Salvador doing this because obviously I went in with a different mindset and it was like, why? And I still question like, why, why do we do that? Can we still improve? Can we do this? Can we do that? Um, I love the teams we've put in place. You know, I'm nothing without our staff and they're awesome. And I still have people that helped win COE still working with us. Um, which is a great, great blessing for us. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, thinking outside the box, trying to be different. Again, yeah. not having that coffee produce tip. I have to watch how I say this, but okay. Like my father's, like my father had the typical coffee producer mentality. What is that typical coffee producer mentality? For him, and I'll only reference him. Yeah, yeah. Was, you know, we didn't, we it, we still don't have a wet or dry milk. So we were selling our cherry directly to a mill. So this was the first time we had separated it, well, kept it separate and then cupped it. Mm -hmm. and it was cupped and we knew what we had. Like before he knew he had obviously special coffee with Kenya varieties we had, and then the elevation of the farms and it being in the, on the Santa Ana volcano and in the golden belt. But, um, you know, we didn't really truly know what we had until COE. Yeah. That's the first time we'd ever cupped our coffee. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious with that in mind, you know, I know that you grew up and there were coffee farms in your family's kind of story and in your family's possession. But what was your personal relationship with coffee before you you know, took the reins of, of those farms, you know, right before that cup of excellence? Well, we didn't, I didn't grow up going to the farms just because, you know, we, the reason we left El Salvador was because of the civil war. So it was an area that was not uh, still very, wasn't very safe. My father did go back and forth, obviously, and he would go to the farms, but he wouldn't take us. And I'm the youngest. Um, but the, oh my God, I lost my train of thought. Well, I'm just curious, like, even if you weren't, even if it wasn't with the farms, what was your relationship with coffee oh, with before? Relationship with like, did you, like, did you like it? Did you, was it incidental? Was it, did you know it was important, but you didn't really feel that, like, what, like, what was, how did you interact with coffee before you, before you were suddenly found yourself running a farm or so multiple farms? Before moving back to El Salvador, I was living in Nashville and I was yeah. working for a company that owned um, a restaurant and a catering company and a bar. And I was the director of operations, which anybody in the service industry just means I wore all sorts of hats. I wasn't very important. <laughs> but um, I'd gotten into, we had a, a roaster that had popped up um, even before Starbucks came in that was Bongo Java. So they were roasting in small batches, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, I got into uh, my French press and I bought a great a blade grinder. And I was like, oh, I knew all about coffee. And then I hadn't been back to El Salvador in a while. And then when I went back uh, summer of that year, my father finally took me to the farms. And I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. 
And I called them. I'm like, I'm moving back. They're like to Miami. I'm like, no, El Salvador. It's like you heard the phone drop. And it was like, what? <laughs> to do what? <laughs> so, I mean, it's just, you know, to me, coffee, um, any part of coffee you're in, uh, you either love it or you hate it, I think. Um, and I think a lot of people, it or takes both. a while. Can, you both, can it be both? Yes. Thanks to Roya or human Copa, <laughs> COVID human Roya, um, you know, it, it brings us back down. But yeah, I mean, it's, you know, to me, I wouldn't trade it. I mean, it's, I'm very lucky. I'm very blessed. I love what I do. I still get excited every single harvest, every single time I go to the farm. So, yeah, yeah. So, Aida, you are one of the things that uh, you're well known for on a, on a continual basis is your experimentation. We were just talking about it before your, your secret experiments, but you also have some that are more public. And mm -hmm. I'm curious what motivates your experimentation. To me, um, when I first started offering, you know, natural to natural and the washed, obviously, it was just like, okay, what, how are other countries doing it and why? And what would that do for us? Well, why are they extending fermentation? What does that do? Why are they drying it on beds? Why are we drying it on clay patios? I mean, it was just a lot of whys and what would happen. And, um, you know, I've never, the only thing I've never done is added anything artificial to the fermentation tanks. Um, I've always tried to highlight the attributes already present. And that's the fascinating part of experiments for me is doing them in a controlled matter, always five gallon buckets when you start, <clears throat> never a whole day's harvest. Yeah. Um, but just trying to see your washed will always be your base, in my opinion. And then you already will, will cup in other cup, you know, like in this cupping, you will see in the different processes, what's happening is you're just highlighting the different attributes that are already there, that are developed more because you extended fermentation, soaked it, whatever you did, did it. Yeah, kind of like as if you're turning up or turning down the volume on different attributes that you already find in the washed. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I particularly like that because it's, it's centric, it's, um, it's egocentric for us washed coffee lovers. <laughs> um, <laughs> Of course, wash coffee should be the base of everything. Uh, and do you, and every year you're doing experimentation? Um, well, the last couple of years has been, especially this past year has been difficult, obviously because of COVID. Yeah. Or human roya, as I like to call it again. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, we all start again this coming harvest for sure. And now that I've got, you know, somebody from UF interested in helping us out. We had a Zoom call yesterday, and I think I was telling you yesterday that he was like, and do -do -do acid, and do -do -do acid, and I was like, doo -do 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 <laughs> uh, well, that's good. Sure. I mean, it, if, if you're in a position to learn new things, and, and I mean, like, I'm curious about that too, because I, I'm curious where you get ideas for new experiments or, or what is guiding them. What, what, what's your kind of like, wh where do you get ideas and, and, when do you know it's a, an idea you want to try versus an idea you don't want to try? Um, a lot of reading, but also, you know, the more I've, uh, through the years, the more I've uh, learned and learned more and more about fermentation and what is happening or what I think is happening there. Um, you know, playing around a lot with uh, trying to control temperatures for a more stable um, fermentation process. I mean, it's just, again, it's, it's curiosity and things that come up and you remember Mario from Jay Hill. I'm lucky enough that he puts up with me where I'm like, ah, let's try it is. And he's like, okay. <laughs> he's, he's a trooper. Like, <laughs> like even an email, he's a trooper. <laughs> um, what, what's changed? I mean, you've been producing coffee for 20 years. What's changed? What's changed about producing coffee? Um, oof, definitely climate. We've seen that. Uh, and then how we have to treat the different um, pests and diseases we deal with. I, as you know, I used to be organic, not because it was by choice, but I had to pull the plug when Roya hit. Yeah. 
Um, and then I started to switch more of a rainforest. I'm not certified, but I follow their practices and I try, I still try to use as many organic products as I can, but I have to use the conventional chemical ones from time to time, but I always use a uh, green label, no herbicides. So our farms have never, well, sorry, in 20 years, they've not seen herbicides. So that's what, very expensive for us, obviously, because we control it by hand. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when I remember visiting your farm when it was organic, and I remember, you know, I've I've heard multi, I've heard other people have to make the same decision moving from organic, and and oddly, uh, a lot more people opting for rainforest recently, uh, certified or not. Great program. I mean, I'm not going to pay for the certification because what our cost production is already high enough. Yeah. Um, but you know, it is a great program. We've always paid more. Um, we've always taken tried to take very good care of our workers as well, because again, without them, it's nothing. So, um, you know, I think it is a great program. I mean, you know, one of the challenges for producers is the cost of the certification. Yeah, yep. These should be a pretty good temperature. Do you wanna start tasting them? Yep, let's do it. Yeah, so we're gonna <laughs> do things for you facsimile veterans. We're going to do things a little bit differently we are going to go through these once and I'm going to describe what I'm tasting. Aida is going to describe what she's tasting. She is the, unfortunately I'm, for all of you, she's a great guest in every way, except for she is not an impartial, uh, impartial juror here <laughs> at this table. Uh, so I'm not going to score them live. I'm, I am going to upload my score sheet to the facsimile website later today though. Uh, and then after we go through them once, we'll we'll talk about what each of these is as we further talk about how and what we're tasting in them. Does that sound good to you? Perfect. Perfect. All right, let's start with blue. It tastes like blueberry and blue fruits and tropical. kind of dark chocolate mm -hmm. yeah, yeah the yeah the caramel i was getting before has definitely transitioned into a more dark chocolate like flavor very creamy uh sparkling acidity Let's move on to green. I'm going to come back to blue after I do green. Mm. Yeah, so green was a lot of praline and sweet nut toffee for me in the, in the fragrance and aroma. It has more fruit now, kind of like cooked stone fruit. What are you getting in, in green? So to me, the green one has that um, creaminess, juiciness, uh, that great creamy body and slightly sparkling acidity, but it's a little bit lower than the blue one. Okay. All right. And yellow. So that strawberry from before, the, the, the element that really is strong in the finish for me is a, a ripe banana, like a, you know, like a freckled banana, that kind of uh, deeper base sweet fruit flavor. What about for you? For me, a lot of tropical fruits, it's um, kind of like, you know, those little cups with the real but fake fruit in that syrup. Yes. Like those dole cups. It's got, right. a, yeah, it's because it's got a little bit of, you know, I get the pineapple coming through. 
the stone fruit, creamy strawberry, chocolate, of course. That strawberry has carried from, from fragrance through to that cup. Mm -hmm. Mm. Orange is quite sweet. It has a balance of body and acidity and sweetness that I think puts it, I think uh, kind of actually wraps together a lot of what's in these previous samples. Uh, because I'm get I'm getting the tea, but I'm also getting some of that. I'm getting more caramel from it now. I'm getting hints at those stone fruits. Um, it has, you know, just it's syrupy for me um, and full, and has a, a nice clean finish while still being quite fruited. What are you getting in orange? Yeah, I like that um, citrusy sparkling acidity. Yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> so this is, this is also the debut of our colored bags. I love them, and I love your bags. I love them too, but one thing Scott and I joked around about is that, you know, we expect that it'll be like yellow, I'm getting banana, which I literally <laughs> said for yellow, lemon, pineapple. And you did say banana with the yellow. Raspberries, but like the golden raspberries. Uh, yeah, I did. That's true. Or, orange tastes like orange to me. Or the other one, I'm sure you've, I'm sure you've witnessed this one. If there's ever a farm called, uh, like, you know, Finca Los Naranjos, like, how many people are going to amazingly taste orange in that coffee? Oh, every time almost. <laughs> Kind of adorable how how like how biased we really all are. Um, I'm, not, I'm not excluding myself from that at all. Uh, okay, wonderful. So again, we are going to we're going to jump into what these are. So, Aida, blue is washed Kilimanjaro, and it's worth pointing out. These are all Kilimanjaro. So this is the last time I'll say the farm Kilimanjaro because uh, it's really hard for me to say that. So the, the first one is washed. Uh, tell us about that process. So this one is the pulp. We fermented it, uh, dry fermentation for 18 hours. And then we dried it on drying beds for nine days. And, um, something uh, Jay Hill's done is they've covered uh, an area. And so the different screens can help us control not only temperature, but UV exposure. So it slowed down the drying for us. It's cooling really nicely too. Uh, sweet, it's, it's staying quite clean. Um, kind of bringing in some honey. And another thing, uh, just to talk a little bit about, I lied, I'm, I'm gonna have to bring up Kilimanjaro again. The Kilimanjaro is a farm that has a Bourbon and then what you often call Kenya. It's a, a mix of uh, SL28 and SL34. And those are produced about 1580 meters to 1720 meters above sea level. Uh, and it's, as you mentioned earlier, your farm is at pretty much the summit of the Santana volcano in El Salvador. On our side, yes. Both Kilimanjaro and Los Alpes are the last coffee farms. And then there's a kilometer and a half from there is the crater. Okay. Yep. Um, what proportion of Bourbon to Kenya is it? 30% Bourbon. 30%. And then like mo the rest pretty much Kenya. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, as accurate as these can ever be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and do you have an idea between the SL28 and the SL34, what that makeup is? Oh, the percentage between the yeah. two? No. Yes. No, yeah. It's tricky. It's tricky. Yeah. I mean, we only discovered it because 
one of our customers had asked, you know, people would ask me forever, like, well, well which Kenya is in? I'm like, I don't know. And then we have WCR in El Salvador now, their Central American office. So then I was like, okay, I'll send it off. And then I was like, no, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll confirm it's an SL24. And they're like, you got both. I was like, yay, <laughs> 28 and 34. Yeah. I, I ne I'm not trying, I, I'm never trying to diminish the value of uh, the role of variety in coffee. But what I am always cautioning buyers about is it's, it's not as, it's not always a, a black and white issue, uh, what the makeup of an entire farm of varieties is. And then also just recognize that there, there are natural mutations that happen. And, and so, I mean, you know, that's, that's how we've gotten most of what we have. And it's, it's not always a crystal clear thing. It's, it's almost impossible to, to arrange such information or, or context for a coffee. Yeah. When you remember, I would never said it was an SL28 until I had it tested. My yeah. customers could, could say it, but I could never because I didn't know. Sure. And they're like, oh, no, but we've been to Kenya. I think that's it. And I'm like, man. <laughs> were you concerned that the coffee police would come and arrest you? <laughs> no, but it's, I was, I couldn't make a fault. To me, it was, from a producer's standpoint, it was a false claim because I didn't yeah. know what it was. When my father bought the farm, that Kilimanjaro was the first farm in El Salvador to have the Kenya variety. Previous owners brought it, but we didn't know which one. Yeah. So no police, but it was just, you know. <laughs> There's a, there's a story there. I mean, whoever brought Kenya in, what, the mid-19th century to El Salvador? Like, there's a story there. No, they brought it. I didn't see it. Oh, there's not a story. Well, my great-great-grandfather brought over the Bourbon variety in the late 1800s. So it have to be, it was after that. Yeah. That's, it's wild. Green. Green is... Burundi style. Can you tell us about that? So Burundi is one of my favorites. Um, and we start, and remember, we had to slightly change. We don't do it exactly like they do in Burundi because we had to take into account the, um, the altitude of the mill, pH, blah, 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 blah. So with Burundi, we start off with Kenya, so 24 hours dry fermentation, but we have to stop the fermentation every 12. And we do that just by adding fresh water, turning it a little bit, and then whatever water you put in, you drain out. And then the following uh, day is 24 hours Ethiopian style fermentation, which is 24 hours underwater. And every 12, we're doing the same. We're taking a little bit of water out, putting a little bit of in, turning it, and that's it. And then the last day we soak it overnight for, tw uh, for 24 hours underwater, fresh water fermentation. Got it. No, so okay. Fermentation. Yeah. Okay. And then it goes through the dry bed. All right. Okay. Wonderful. Um, I'm, yeah, I, as it's cooling, also getting sweeter, I'm getting uh, fresh apricot, sweet cream, really nice, really ho uh, holding up as it cools. Let's talk about yellow, which is anyone, anyone natural. <laughs> so what is the process for a natural at, at J Hill? So for us, we bring the, the coffee comes in, we float it obviously to get rid of the floaters and also to get rid of a lot of the dirt. And then it goes straight to the drying bed. And it takes anywhere from 10 to 11 days to dry. I'm thinking about the... Yeah, it has also cooled nice and sweet. It's, I mean, of course, like not as clean as the other samples on the table. But it has, it has nice weight. It's gone into more dried, you know, like dried fruits as it cools, which are complementary to its dry mouthfeel. Um, 
Wonderful. And orange. Orange. Which I also refer to red. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. So orange is ice frozen cascada tea mm. fermentation. So this one I started two years ago. Um, well, two. Yeah, two years ago. So this one, we brew the cascada tea in buckets. We let it cool. We take bags, we freeze them in blocks. And then the following day when the coffee comes in, we depulp the coffee and then we put the blocks in and we let it ferment with the frozen cascada tea for 18 hours which that's where it keeps the same temperature. And I think I have something on my Instagram, but it's pretty cool because it's like blocks. You're like shoving in to the fermentation tank. And then after that, it just goes straight to drying beds. Yeah. When you were describing this to me, because all of the information, all of what Aida is talking about will also be on the facsimile website. It's in the link below it. I've scheduled it to become available in about eight minutes. So just, just just hold on, just hold that <laughs> click for eight minutes. Um, when you were describing to the miss to me, I believe I laughed out loud because when, when you described it, it was like, oh, you actually make like a giant iced tea inside of the fermentation tanks because you're dropping these gigantic iced tea bricks on top of the, the coffee. Yeah, I mean, and it's again, we, we uh, freeze it the day before, a couple days before, however long it might take because we do pretty big blocks and then it goes, um, let me see if I can quickly find a photo. Did I sent you a photo, didn't I? No, Ew. but no one would be upset right now if you posted it, if you, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so let me get. It looks like a photo, oh, I see it. Oh yeah, okay, yep, yep. So those are th those big dark shapes on that on that image are the the iced cascara tea bricks ice cubes gigantic ice cubes yeah let's see yeah and you told me that by the time it finishes its its fermentation process about 18 hours later the bricks have melted but it they're still quite like the water the melted tea is still quite cold Exactly. Exactly. So again, we're, we're keeping, the goal is trying to keep the same temperature throughout. You, of course, implanted early on in this cupping, in my mind, the idea that this tastes like tamarind. It's so distinct now as it cools. How would you describe tamarind to some, because I'm, I'm realizing that that's, I'm trying to think of how to describe tamarind to someone who has never tasted it. Because I have a feeling that there might be a handful who haven't. Maybe, maybe I'm mistaken. Oh, I don't know. How would you describe him? The only thing I came up with is it's like somewhere on, somewhere in a world in which, in a Venn diagram of overlapping like lemon and this will sound negative, but I don't mean it in a negative way, but like, just imagine I mean it in a pleasant way, like lemon, bark, and, um, or like some sort of like eucalyptic or, or something kind of herbal, uh, and maybe even something like some sort of smoked herb or something like that, smoked herb. God. I don't mean like that. I don't mean like that kind of herb, but. No, but remember, tamarind is in a little seed pot. I mean, you're basically eating the flesh of a seed. Yeah. It's got that little, you know, hard skin that when it's ready, it cracks off, but you're basically eating just the flesh and the seed yeah. is inside. Uh, but really not, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's certainly a unique flavor that is, I would say is not in these other ones. Or do you feel like you get tamarind from the washed? There's like a little, <laughs> but not in the way it comes through in the other one. Yeah. Okay. Great. 
Um, wonderful. Uh, you know, we have we have some other questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna see what's going on in the chat too. Yeah, because I don't. Um, have I don't have access to the chat, right? Yeah, uh, Lance Hedrick said, um, I mean, if you pulled up YouTube, but I'm not encouraging you to right now. Okay. Um, I mean, because you'll get distracted watching something else. Um, <laughs> Lance Hedrick pointing out definitely Malik and Tamarind uh, and he, that he drinks Tamarind juice all the time, which who knows. Um, someone is asking, what is meant by not as clean? I said it, so I feel like I have to defend it. Um, there is a clarity of flavor that I experience in one, two, and four that I'm not experiencing as clearly in three. And by one, two, and four, I mean blue, green, and orange, and not yellow. In yellow, there's a little bit more of a murkiness in what flavor is being catalyzed to my, my taste sensation. Uh, and then someone else is pointing out that you can buy whole pod tamarinds at uh, Whole Foods, which is helpful. Um, so, so go to Whole Foods, buy some tamarind, eat some tamarind, and then come back. Um, <clears throat> great. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring Scott in here in, in, a, in a second. Uh, I'm curious if you would be willing to talk about, to, to answer a few other questions. For example, can you explain to all of us the impact of Reposo on the cup? Yes, okay, so um, for a lot of uh, non-experienced buyers or new buyers or non-coffee buyers or someone that's not used to um, cupping a lot of fresh coffees. Um, what, the reason we let it rest and is ex it's extremely important and crucial is because, uh, you know, how would I describe fr fresh coffee? Is it's, it's grassy. It's like it still hasn't like developed. If, and that, I know that sounds weird to say because you've already picked it, you've already processed it, you've already dried it. But then something is happening inside the little parchment where it's kind of like settling. You know, the seed inside is, is settling and, and the moisture and all that is doing its thing. How, yeah. if, for us, it's crucial. I've had people before. We did one experiment, which was fascinating. We left the coffee, and that was actually Kilimanjaro, at 16% moisture because they were trying to mimic the way they cup some of the coffees when they go to uh, And I was like, oh, 16. I was like, ah. And I said, we'll do it, but we have to FedEx this out immediately. We back, we, we um, <clears throat> dry mill it, backpack it, and it's gone. Because if not, it starts to fade immediately. Well, yeah. within, a, within like three weeks. And yeah, but that was a really cool one. And it helped me learn because I was like, well, you know, again, like, why, why, why? <laughs> I right. It. Well, I mean, the more moisture too, I, I've often tried to, to say that Reposo just is part of drying, that it's almost a misnomer to describe it as a separate step from drying insofar as if you, if you're not done with drying, then you may still have a viable germ that is going to fade because it's, it, if it's viable, then it's keeping itself, uh, essentially alive through, um, it, you know, eating the only nutritional content available to it, which is itself. Yeah. Um, oh, that's so big. That's, <laughs> that's an awful thing. But it's, you're right, you're right, but it sounds awful. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, but that, I mean, that's, that's also just what a seed is, right? Like it's just, I'm, I'm ready to turn into a plant here. <laughs> um, which is itself. Yeah. Um, oh, that's so big. That's, <laughs> that's an awful thing. <laughs> How, so have you had an opportunity to taste the SL28 from your farm separated from the SL34? I have, and hold on, because I'm ready for it, because I have got it in my notes. Give me one. Hello, Scott. Hi, Scott.
Scott yeah. and I once a month get on a video call with each other with a guest and see if how Scott's internet connection is. <laughs> that's that's always, a game. I'm, I'm always in a hotel, so it's always off. <laughs> yeah, Scott is... If you, Scott, Scott, people re- repeatedly ask me, where is Scott? And I'm always just like, I have no idea. I have no idea. Look at, well, look at his Instagram. Instagram. Yeah. He's, he's not home because he doesn't have one. Ah, now I feel bad for saying that. <laughs> um, yeah, let's not, let's not. Okay, here he is. Okay. Um, okay, so you, so Aida was just, was looking up uh, notes on, because I, I think what we're interested in knowing, we had a, a question from one of our one of our cuppers in the audience. Mm-hmm. What uh, was curious the flavor difference between the SL twenty eight and the SL thirty four, and I think in, in particular from Kilimanjaro, Haro, given the samples in front of us, would be mm-hmm. a helpful. Yes, helpful point. It'd be amazing to hear because uh, I don't think I don't. I mean, every every time you buy a Kenya, there's like a mixture of SL twenty eight and thirty four. I don't know how many. How many of us have ever had him separately? Aida, are you pulling up oh, notes? It's about, okay. So it's for me, okay. So for the 28, um, finer, more subtle acidity and a bit more balanced. And I think it's a little bit sweeter than the 34. To me, the 34 is like in your face, like acidity, which is great. But, you know, it's different than the 28 and it tends to be a lot more um, like grapefruit or not uh, raspberries, but you know that like not really super ripe raspberries, but the ones that are still kind of not green, but not. Is this 34 you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so like maybe raspberries that aren't entirely Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Or certainly not in that later stage of ripeness. Yeah. 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 That, de- that definitely meshes with my experience, which I, I included in Dear Coffee Buyer. I did have the opportunity in Kenya to cup some samples that were more, and again, nothing, nothing's ever 100, but this one has a lot more SL28. This one has a lot more SL34 and, and across a handful of of um, different washing stations. And from my experience, yeah, SL thir- SL28, um, a softer, more stone fruit, the black currant, kind of more uh, creamy cup, and SL34 was zestier, verging on those, like the grapefruit or the tangerine, in the better cases, and the dark chocolate. And, and definitely the SL34 had the more nuanced, subtle qualities, and the SL 30, the SL28 and the SL34 had the more aggressive um, citric qualities. Both very good and sweet. <laughs> like, like no complaints for me about either of them. I think there's a, I think when people hear those, they're sometimes like, so I really only want the SL28. I'm like, I, I just don't, I don't know if you can say that with confidence. Um, I don't know if we could pick apart Kenya necessarily to improve it. What about... I, I think you have some pockets. I mean, it's impossible to have a farm in El Salvador and not have some pockets. How, how about pockets and Bourbon? I think they're, so I, it's a mutation of Bourbon, so they're similar, but it's not as sweet or chocolatey, in my opinion, as Bourbon. Yeah. yeah. It's not as complex. Yeah, I, yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I think, I think they're both like, let's just say this from the top. I've had 88 plus podcasts. I've had 88 plus per bone. I would say on the whole, the per bone seem a little bit more capable of a deeper level of, of another level of complexity. And one of the places where I most often experience the difference is in the, the proponent can have a, a nicer, longer finish than the, the pockets. And I'll be honest with you too, to the horror of yourself and any, every other Salvadoreño out there, I, 
I am lumping my taste experience with Pacas in with my taste experience of Katura. Mm. That's, I know it's controversial. Do you want to hang up right now? <laughs> <laughs> the, but just to be clear, that the, the like inside joke here is that Pacas is probably Katura, but but you should not ever say that to a person from El Salvador because as I've done, because the, the name and the family is, is important. I mean, I think every fourth person in El Salvador has the last name Pacas <laughs> and certainly in coffee. Um, and, uh, and of course it's, it's something that, that Salvadoranos have a lot of pride about that. It's, that it's the Salvadoreno variety. Mm. Yeah, and the other one, remember, is the Pacamar. Obviously, right, of, of course. Yeah. So. Yeah. Scott, are we ever going to have a Pacamara? No. <laughs> <laughs> they're too hard to roast well. They're the, they're the coffee that comes out okay in the sample roaster, and then you buy it all excited, and then you're disappointed with every production roast. It's so hard. Also, like Aida's story, I don't, I don't, think, it's only, I don't think it's only a sample roaster thing. I also think Pacamara's fade faster than anything else I've ever had. They're, they're so good when you're, when you're at the mill and they're mm -hmm. just off the patios. And then, you know, I've never had a good Pacamara arrival. Uh, yeah. Hey, there's a, there was one really interesting changes. Do you notice by slowing down the drying process by changing the UV exposure? And you cut out, can you repeat it? Cause you froze. Sure. sure, sorry. What changes do you notice by slowing down the drying process by altering the UV exposure? Hmm. I would say a more um, necessarily not so much in the cup, but as far as shelf life with the coffee of mm -hmm. the green, if that makes sense. Is a feedback we've gotten when we've slowed down the and kind of controlled that because of, you know, you're not exposing it at higher temperatures or higher UV and all that. So that's what we've noticed. Okay, excellent. Um, someone asked kind of a funny, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Scott. Someone had a funny question of of how many of your experiments are, are total duds that you're not happy with. <laughs> well, I've had a few for sure that I, you know, I was super excited about and then I cuffed them and I was like, never do that again. Which again is why I always say to buyers or producers, please, when you experiment, use a five gallon bucket. I know it doesn't replicate uh, <laughs> as a fermentation tank, but don't put a whole day's worth of cherries at risk. Yeah. Because there's so much that can go wrong or so right, um, you know, that, a lot of buyers get all excited and the producers do too. And then the end result sucks. And the buyer's like, I, uh, yeah, sorry, I can't, I can't take that. So I've had a few, um, I was trying to think, I haven't had a few in a while. What's the worst one? Oh, when we first started doing the Sumavador, you know, the Sumavador is what I call the Sumatra. <laughs> oh. Yeah. When we first started trying to get nail that one down, we had some, Awful, awful. So Sumalvador would be you were trying to wet hull oh, coffee exactly. from, from your farm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you would you would dry the coffee and then you would like to about 40 or 50 percent. Something. something like that, probably. Yeah. And then and then hull it. And then back on the patios. And when Right. You know, when we first did it, I was like, oh, but it's going to, you know, the, the beans are going to be all white and faded. And they were like the nicest, like green, jade green. Oh, nice. Color. Okay. Color. So, but again, the, fir the first few times it was just like. Mm. <laughs> and I still, I mean, I still it's a good portmanteau. Good it's good marketing, Sumalvador. That's good. <laughs> well, because, you know, I have to be careful and I've changed and how, because I was always like, Burundi and Ethiopia. And I was like, no, 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 no. Okay, so Bruni fermentation process, because I don't want to get sued. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. And Sumatra was like, no, and Sumavo. <laughs> Someone asked what the difference between Pacas and Pacamara is. Um, and, and just to be clear, I, I, 
Aida, could you can you describe the difference, like like what what the significance of Pacas Pacamara is? Because it's like Pacas is actually maybe the least consequential thing about Pacamara. Well, it's the mutation of Pac, uh, Pacas and Marawipe, and the the challenge with Pacamara is you can either have um, the vegetable one, which I, I don't care for, but they also have a beautiful uh, floral one. Yeah. But I mean, that's the difference is, is God, it's in the cup. Again, one tasting like vegetables, like <laughs> tomato soup and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the Margo Hipe is a is a naturally occurring mutation of Tithika that produces very large tree, very large cherries, very large beans, like like noticeably larger coffee seeds. And in El Salvador, Teki Seek did some work in the you know 50s, 60s, 70s, something like that. I'm not good at history. To, the late, 1958, the late 50s. Okay to uh, graft it onto a pacas plant so that you could get the beans that the cherries of the Margo Hipe with the, the yields and also the more manageable coffee tree to harvest of a pacas because a pacas is quite short tree. I mean, the Margo Hipe is, you know, easily is twice my height. I'm, I'm pretty short, but still twice my height. Um, and the pacas, you know, I, I tower over the pacas trees. Um, uh, Tony mentioned that, you know, we used to have some good Pacamaras at Tonks. I just want to point out some of the, some of the most amazing coffees I've ever kept have been Pacamaras. Uh, and, and you can get them in good condition back to like, you know, your, your, your destination, uh, your coffee destination, your drinking destination, consumption destination. But, um, I, I've, I've just, I've had kind of transcendent Pacamara tasting experiences, but they're always a, they're always a sample roast, you know, at the washing station or at the farm. Um, so another question for you. This this question is clearly coming from an informed person. A lot of these questions came from uh, our friend Luca Costanza. Luca Costanza. Luca. Luca. Um, he knows that you, he believes that you have some Starmea or Starmaya variety. Can you so, talk about what that is and what it's like? Okay, so they're not personally on our farms, but I have, um, I started, oh God, 12 years ago now, um, the Ada Batley Selection Program, the ABS program to help out other producers that weren't into this market, you know, and the importance of sorting on processing and cleanliness of mills and blah, blah, blah. And I currently work in with producers in El Salvador and also in Mexico hmm. in the Tapachula area. And they have Star Maya. And that was the first time I'd ever seen it. Um, the Star Maya is a higher yielding uh, variety that is more, a little bit more resistant to rust. It's not rust resistant, but it's a little bit more resistant than say your, your average bourbon. Um, it has, it tends to have a really creamy body. Um, the fruits tend to be, uh, it's been a while since I, cu I cupped it earlier this year. We go through some of my notes. Acidity, uh, background fruits. It's a really lovely coffee. It, and it's, you know, different, again, it's a really high yielding uh, variety. And a lot of people, they I think it was developed in Nicaragua. Yeah. Okay. Scott, what else did you see in the chat of note? Sorry, I keep I keep cutting it up, but I'm I'm actually curious um, if if Aida has preferences uh, amongst amongst the processes in, in these coffees. Like it's her coffee, and I'm kind of curious what she leans towards or has a go to. For me, um, Burundi is one of my favorites because I think it is 
a beautiful balance between, uh, you know, the Kenya style or the Ethiopian style. Mm -hmm. You know, the sparkly acidity, the creamy juiciness of the body. Um, obviously, the washed is the washed. The natural. I really like our naturals. Um, you know, we we go through a lot of um, uh, steps to make sure that we have like a consistent uh, nice cup mm -hmm. and the cascara tea yeah. cascara tea is fun you know again I've never flavored coffee I've never done anything funky in the processes but this you know for me to add it back you know add the fruit part of the coffee back in is fun yeah I tend to agree there's there um the Burundi style, ha it, it certainly, especially as they cool, has remained quite sweet and really like the structure, the acidity have, have really held together. Uh, this would be a good moment to, uh, if you asked a question and we didn't, we didn't ask it, uh, please uh, throw it up there again. Make sure there's a question mark on it because um, that will help me. Um, Tony, Tony had a good question recently. Yeah. He said, uh, Aida, do you ever feel pressure from buyers to do experiments outside of your comfort zone? No, I mean, <laughs> we, what we'll do is, and they know this and I'll be upfront is we will try anything for them. But once we see that it's gonna ruin the coffee, we'll pull the plug. And that's what we'll say, because we don't want them to ruin coffee. We don't want to ruin coffee. We don't want them to have to pay for it unless they're using it as an example of what fermented coffee should be. Mm -hmm. And if that's the mm -hmm. case, because we have had one and said, you know, ruin the coffee. I want to make sure people understand what ferment is. So we'll do that. But other than that, no, I mean, it, again, it's fun for us. It's fun to, to have, you know, the buyers come in and they're like, oh, we were just here and we'll try this and we'll try that. Now I won't try, because I heard somebody was doing this. Some farm was digging up a hole in dirt and then shoving the coffee, recently depulped coffee in there and sure. I was like, yeah, I won't do that. Bummer. Yeah. Yeah. When you were, when you were describing some of the experiments and, and like the duds and errors before, the, the thing that went off my head is this thing that I started hearing when I would spend time with coffee producers, which is just a reminder, a mantra. All of the coffee gets bought. All, all of the coffee gets consumed. Someone's going to drink all of it. Well, yeah. not, well, not one person, but. <laughs> yeah what is what's something you would recommend to people who want to improve their cupping skills a lot of our audience are people who are interested in you know upping their their cupping and their tasting skills what's something you would recommend definitely keep joining um events like this or, or you know what you guys are doing is absolutely so cool and I'm so excited and honored to be a part of it because, you know, it's, it's different. We interchange, people get to, to ask you questions. They get to learn from you guys. Uh, so keep doing this, keep watching videos, keep practice, practice, practice. You know, I know, I don't know if they're having any classes. I don't know. If, is Expo still happening? Does anybody know? Yeah, so far, <laughs> yes. Mm. I know, I know. I think they can't get their money back. I think that's the big issue. Yeah, I, I feel for them. But, yeah. um, but you know, when there's cupping classes available, uh, I know right now with, again, with COVID, it's our human Roya. <laughs> I don't know when it, I don't think we'll ever go back to cupping the way we used to. Yeah, yeah. What, uh, who is someone who you learned a lot about cupping from or with? Douglas from J Hill. Yeah, definitely Douglas. And then definitely that's another one. Tim Hill. Mm hmm. Yeah. Tim Hill. Yeah. Tim Hill is a good, you know, Tim started like a month or two before I started working with counterculture in 2004. Yeah. I, knew Tim. I always joke and say, I knew him when he was this big. <laughs> <laughs> Tim Hill and and it's worth pointing out that Tim Hill helped us bring these coffees in to share with everyone. 
Uh, and his name, you know, Atlantic special. Yeah, he's, he's yeah, at Atlantic. Yeah. Um, and you know, Tim, Tim and I almost always didn't didn't uh, cross paths, but one time we we were able to cup uh, and spend a little bit of time together in Brazil, of all places, in one of my one of my last uh, international buying trips um, back in the day. All right. Um, well, that is so wonderful. Um, Aida, I can't tell you how much fun this was and how much we enjoy having you um, and, and having your expertise on these and, and just this opportunity to taste, you know, these different processes across the same coffee otherwise. Really cool. No, oh, thank you again, guys. I've had so much fun. Um, and just a reminder, please do submit your notes. I, um, you know, I, I, I kind of, uh, we, we, so we got a lot of, we got a lot of input, which is awesome. Um, and just like really quickly on, so on blue, uh, lots of, lots of like clean red apple, bright apricot, chocolate, chocolate, floral, on green, um, a lot of the notes were like interesting berries. I see in one, both lingonberry and cranberry. Um, floral, some uh, green apple, uh, red orange. That's the name of this bag. So maybe they got confused. <laughs> I'm, I'm just joking. Uh, tart, fruity um, on yellow. Um, lots of yellow. Everyone just said yellow. Uh, no, a uh, lot of tropical, tropical um, berries. Someone said bananas, blueberries, uh, wild, which I think is a cool descriptor. Um, and on orange, tea, 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 oolong, tea, black tea, lychee, lychee, lychee. Lactic acid, overripe stone fruit, cacao. Um, and we also had people guess. And it looked like everyone knew that um, what process they were. Everyone knew that yellow was natural, pretty much. Yeah. Um, the rest were harder. Uh, uh, about half of them thought, about half of them thought the first one was washed, and the other half thought it was a honey blue, which was washed. On green, it was like half washed, half half people responding, I don't know, and I don't want to guess, which was an option I gave. Uh, and then on orange, again, most people said natural for this one correctly. On, on orange, some wash, some honey, kind of a mix of all, even natural uh, and pulp natural. Uh, yeah. So... Um, well, this is so wonderful. So I will post my, my score sheet online on the facsimile website later today, as well as the link to this video. Um, and yeah, Aida, I can't, can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Um, as always, please, uh, cuppers, send us your feedback, uh, your love mail, your hate mail, your, I don't know what it is, mail. Um, and we'll see you again next month. Thanks again, guys. Thank you, Aida. Thanks so much. Okay. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye-bye.